Hi, I'm Nate with Average Jack Archery Pro Shop and Range here in Phillipsburg, PA. And today I want to go over how I set up a dropaway rest from start to finish. And this is true whether um, I do this with a uh, cable driven setup like we're going to set up here today or a limb driven setup. And I'll pull the limb driven setup and show you that because that is a, a different timing issue uh, than we have with a cable activated rest. So I'm going to pull this one out here. Like I said, this is the R2 from QAD. QAD is a phenomenal company. I'm kind of going a little rant here while I'm setting this up. Uh, QAD is a veteran owned company uh, out of uh, Virginia and they make a all of their top of the line rests. Their HDX, their MIX, uh, the R2. The R2 has been a phenomenal seller for us this year. Well, that's what happens when you uh, are trying to film during uh, video hours or during shop hours rather. You got to answer the shop phone. Hello? Well, when customers call, you got to answer the phone. What can you do? And in the interim, while I was doing that, I set this rest up with the felt the way that I like to set it up. So um, QAD HDX or um, the Ripcord or something like the Trophy Rig Sync all come with a felt system that goes in and around the launcher. Now, what I don't like to do with it, though, is I don't like to install that felt all the way around the arms like you usually would. What I prefer to do is actually cut the felt and just apply felt down into the V-notch groove where the arrow would slide. If if you don't do that, let me grab an arrow. If you don't do that, you get the, the plastic slide on the carbon, whereas you get the felt nice and quiet. If you install the felt all the way around, that's usually the first thing that peels off. Um, I don't know why the adhesive isn't all that great. None of the rest manufacturers, at least that I encounter, have a really good strong felt that goes on there. So I usually just cut it off and install it there in the V-notch. That also then gives me extra felt then to cut later down the road when that wears through uh, from the constant shooting of those rough carbon arrows. And then I can install more felt down in the middle. Then what I like to do on the HDX and the sync models in particular is I will then take shrink tubing, quarter inch shrink tubing or 3 inch inch shrink tubing. You don't need super expensive stuff. I get it from your local big box store like Lowe's, Home Depot, even Harbor Freight has really good stuff that I like to use. And it comes in different colors like green and black. Um, and then I will cut that to length and then I will install that over the arms and heat it up with a lighter and get it to shrink down over. That will give then that outside, that tap resistance, uh, but then they usually that shrink tubing stays on there much longer than that felt because the arrow realistically isn't gonna do a whole lot of this in there. Okay, so that shrink tubing really allows that to be a much quieter sound. You can also install it over the top arm as well. The R2 does come with a nice little piece of felt, so on the underside it's quiet. Right, so I do install on the underside of the R2, but on most other models it's shrink tubing on the top arm and the two arms with just felt in the middle. The R2, like I said, is an integrate model, so there is no burger button hole uh, bolt for it. So this is just going to get installed right on here. The Athens is nice. It has a, a machine groove on the riser that is the center of the burger hole, so I know to line that up. And then this here, for any drop away style rest, is just getting centered up in a ballpark flush to the back of the riser. So the HDX, I'll install the burger hole with the bolt, and then I will push it, take my finger, push the body of the rest up against solid against the back of the riser because usually that's a nice flat uh, flat and flush surface. So I'm going to uh, adjust this a little bit as I put it a little bit too high right off the get-go. And then from here, we can then use the uh, actual body mount, the bolts of the rest to install it. On the HDX, I strongly recommend, like I said, I don't have one pulled out of the box here, but on the HDX in particular, I strongly recommend removing the bolt that's initially there. There's a little plastic block in there that's a spacer block. Uh, it's probably about three eighths of an inch thick, maybe a little bit less than that. And it comes with a longer bolt. So remove the uh, arm with the short bolt, thread through the longer bolt, put that spacer block on there. And any bow is really gonna require, modern bow is gonna require that spacer block. In particular, the wider riser ones like PSE, Matthews in particular, the phase four V3X, V3, all the way down to even like the triax, which I have one hanging behind me, are all gonna need that spacer block to push that rest far enough over to get to a proper center shot location. From here, I can go ahead and figure out knock height, and this is just an eyeball test, realistically. So I can click the launcher up, and I'm gonna look and see how it looks in relations to the burger hole on the riser. Most bows now come with two burger hole locations, so you get a nice level plane to see where this comes off of. And I can see right now, just kind of eyeballing it, we're pretty daggum close with this rest right out of the box. So I'm actually going to 
lock that into position right there, and we will move that later as we go to actually paper tune this bow. Most rests come with the Allen keys, and particularly the QAD HDX, it comes with a short little stubby angle uh, Allen key, which uh, allows you to get in behind the bridge riser of Hoyts, but also allows you to get um, with Hamsky models too, which we'll talk about later, in underneath the roller guard uh, or the uh, just a fixed cable rod for um, any other bow to adjust the lateral movement. The lateral movement of the R2 here is actually on the launcher blade. So what I'm going to do is again, I'm going to click this up into position and I've taken my T-square again and on my T-square I have marked with silver sharpie 13 16 so from the end of the rod over 13 16 I've marked that on both sides. 13 16 is the most nominal uh, center shot direction and what that is is that's taking it and sticking it into the burger button holes and then actually lining up the center of the arrow as it's clicked into the rest on the string. So actually right out of the box this comes at 13 16 for me. Athens and Prime I think they're the only two that are still out there. Recommend 7 8 as a starting point instead of 13 16 So I am going to loosen up this launcher blade a little bit. And I'm just going to push this out just a touch to get it just slightly bound. So, 13, so 7 8 is 14 16 So it's not a whole lot of movement, but it is enough. So I'm just going to set that up there. That looks close to 7 8 Go ahead and really get that down. On your HDX models and your trophy ridge sink and all that sort of stuff, you would of course adjust your lateral height out here and your interior on the inside and you would move that launcher up and down base to get that nice 90 degree look at least to start. The tough part now is getting this and how we install this either in through a served cable or using the football clamp. So the football clamp which comes with most rest comes in a couple different pieces. It's usually both halves of the football clamp, a little nut and a little screw and then sometimes there's a washer involved. This is not my preferred method of clamping things on, but that's because I have a press. If you don't have a press, you can go ahead and install the football clamp. You want to clamp the football clamp, though, depending on the company. Well, actually, regardless of the company, but depending on the size of the football clamp, you want to make sure it's definitely going on the down cable. So as this bow gets drawn, one of these cables is going to go up and one of these cables is going to go down. With a single cam bow, the big long string that goes all the way around, it's going to go up and the Y yoke, the bus cable, is going to go down. So make sure you identify which one's going to go down. If you don't know which one's going to go down, just kind of like half draw the bow a little bit and just see which one's going up and which one's going down. I can identify it's this one. The serving's down here. So I would take my football clamp and I would install it right here at the bottom edge of the serving. I do not want to actually install it onto the strands of the string. That would be the exposed, the colored parts. In this case, with the stock uh, gas strings that come with the Athens, it's this gray. With Matthews, it's going to be uh, twisted up black for their stock strings. Uh, for PSE, a lot of times, like a brown color. Um, but at any rate, I would install that on the actual serving of that down cable. I'm going to put mine to a press uh, because I think that's a much, much uh, stronger method and a much more preferred method. Of course, it means you need to go to a shop if you don't own your own press. But the football clamp will work. I just don't like having little plastic nuts and bolts on my bow if I can avoid it. But if you're doing that homework, it will work out just fine for you. So now I have the cord through the down cable and I'm going to butt it up all the way up against the bottom side of that serving. So that's a good fixed place. I have a little bit of play here. And now comes the part where we time the rest. So we make sure that the bow is set up at the specifications that we want to shoot it at. Um, for me, it would be about a 31 inch draw. Um, I'm going to leave this as it's set up. This is uh, a bow that people have been demoing in our store. Right now, I believe it's at 28 and a half, so it's a little bit short. I would recommend putting an arrow in, grabbing a release, and doing all that sort of stuff. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and do. So I never want to draw this back, ideally, with my fingers. Now, I will do it. If I'm working here. I've got a whole bunch of different customers. I will go ahead and grab this with my fingers and try to get it. I don't recommend you doing that, though, mostly because, and I don't even like doing it, uh, because you can uh, run the risk of coming to full draw, hitting let off, and twisting a little bit, and you'll derail the bow. And that's really bad news, or even worse, you hit let off, you let go, and then you dry fire the bow. Either way, you're going to damage something, uh, and that's a real bummer when all you're trying to do is set up a rest. So let me grab my release and an arrow. And of course, usually, too, I would go ahead and point this at a target as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the rest clicked up. The QAD, the ripcord, everybody uh, that makes arrests like this, they will usually have witness marks on here. For QAD, they are two white lines. And I know when those two white lines meet each other, that means that the rest is fully met its tension. And it will 
fire when it's actually shot. So what I'm doing is this cord is not tied in, so it has the ability to pull in and out. Now it would be a tough pull, but it will pull itself in and out. And I want this to actually come and meet the drawing. I think it's gonna be a little bit long right now. Oh no, it's actually gonna work out just great. All right, so that actually ended up being a little bit short. And what it did was it actually pulled itself all the way out to the right length that it needs. So when I was looking at it there, let me do it again. That pulled itself all the way. So those two white lines right there come to full draw together. The biggest um, issue that I see when people set up a drop away rest is that they over tighten. They leave these lines, they'll meet like halfway through the draw cycle, and then it's just constantly pulling and pulling and pulling until they get the rest of the draw cycle. And that will really mess with the internal workings of your rest. Uh, on the QAD HDX in particular, uh, where it's not integrated like this, the outside barrel, I've seen it a lot where it starts to pull away. There's a plastic cap or a rubberized plastic cap that's on the end, and it starts to kind of pull away a little bit. And that shows me that they've been shooting the rest uh, with too much tension for a really long time or way too many shots. But now I can see when I come to full draw that it meets full draw as I get there within the last inch of the draw cycle. So right around in there, as I struggle with it here, right there it meets and then I finish off the rest of the draw cycle. So that bow will fire and the rest will drop out of the way in perfect timing. Cord length now is really good. So now at this point I have a couple of options. One, I can mark this cord on this side with like a silver sharpie or something like that. What I'll do, I'm not going to cut anything, so I'm actually going to make a knot. Oh, my wife and kids have showed up. I'm going to make a knot here on the back side of the cable, and I'm still going to leave this tag in really long, but now I have a knot here so it can't pull through any further. Now that I've established that knot, I'm going to go ahead and draw this bow again just to ensure. Yep, we're still hitting both those white lines. That cord's under plenty of tension. It's not overly pulling on the down cable. And we're ready to go ahead and start paper tuning this setup before we clip this cord and uh, tighten everything up. So I'm not gonna go through the full paper tuning process. I have other videos on my channel about that. Let's pretend that we have paper tuned it. Maybe we needed to make a little left right adjustment, maybe a little bit up and down. But what that allowed us to do with this one knot on this backside is we were allowed to, uh, just a single half hitch, is we can loosen it take that knot out, pull a little bit of cord out if we need to move the rest up to make it longer, or if we need to move the rest down a little bit, we can uh, loosen that knot, pull a little bit of cord through, tighten it back up, and we're right back to where we started. But now the rest isn't overly pulling or isn't a little bit on the slack side where you might get some uh, misfires where you're not actually timing it each and every single time you pull back the bow. So once we'd have that, I still have this knot here on the backside of the cable. I'm actually gonna tie a second overhand knot and what this allows me to do now that I have two knots in here before I cut this cord is it gives me plenty of working slack. Now, if I take this rest off and put it on a different bow, like I said, now I have two overhand knots over here. I now clip this cord, melt the end so it's nice and flush, and now I just have two little knots sitting here. In the event that I shoot a different arrow and I need to repaper tune, I can undo my knots and pull this cord out. I can pull it tighter, undo the knots, so on and so forth. But now that it's butted up against this serving here, which is part of the cable, it can't move up any further. Uh, it's definitely not going to move down. That's not how the rest, because the rest is always going to pull it up, right? Gravity is definitely not going to pull it down any harder uh, than this is going to get pulled up when they actually go to fire the bow. So that is how I set up a drop away rest that's cable activated or cable actuated. Let me show you a limb driven rest really quickly because that one is way simpler. So here we have a limb driven rest. All of them function exactly the same, just like they do with the cable activated rest in the sense that you have to time it. However, with a limb driven rest, it's tied into the limb. So when the limb flexes, the rest comes up. This here is a Prusik knot system that I've got in line uh, with the, uh, uh, with the activation cord here. And I again, I don't like the football clamp because the cable uh, with tying a knot like this, I'd actually just push the knot and then the launcher is up, right? So the launcher stays up when it's not under tension. And when you pull it down with the limb at brace, it stays down. So as the limb curls in through the draw cycle, the rest arm comes up. When I, With me allowing to loosen it like this, I can then, a lot easier anyway, without having to pull a knot through and make sure everything's in time, I can now click an arrow on here and I can check my level. I can check my left, right. And once I'm done doing those things and getting that adjustment, and again, here's that example of that grubby Allen screw that uh, QAD sells. You have to kind of fit it in here in the top of a ham ski. Um, 
if, if you can't uh, if you can't find one, you can easily make one with a hacksaw or a grinder with the right size Allen key. I just pull on the one limb leg or the one cable leg rather, pull that knot down, and now it's back under tension. This is the same type of knot that you would use on like your lineman's belt or if you're a saddle hunter on your tether. So it is held under tension, and the more you pull on it, the tighter it gets. So the more you shoot it, the tighter it gets, the more it stays in place. But now that's all simple that was. I didn't have to draw the bow 10,000 times uh, to make sure that cord stays uh, locked in and it's on the right length. It's always at the right length. Where people get hung up on timing a limb-driven rest versus a cable-activated rest is with the placement of the cord on the actual limb itself. So a cable-activated rest is a fixed drop placement. So what that means is, is that you come to full draw and then as soon as you fire, it starts to come out of the way. With a limb-driven rest, the further you move this away from the limb tip, so you think of the limb, right? The limb starts flexing at the tip first on the axle and flexes the least and not at all the further you get up here. So what that means is when you're clear out by the axle, as soon as you start drawing this bow, the launcher will immediately start picking up, which means it picks up early and it drops late because the last thing to come down when you shoot is the axle. So when guys have uh, issues tuning or guys have issues uh, with uh, you know being really technical with their form when they go to paper tune and that kind of stuff, it's usually because they've tied the cord onto the axle or if it's like the Matthews with their bracket, they've tied it all the way out here. And since it holds on to the arrow the longest, it's usually the most critical when it comes to tuning. If you're all the way up in here, it will pick up very late and drop very early and you might not get a good containment of your arrow and again it'll be really fickle in tuning. I find that a great placement on almost any bow manufacturer, even Matthews with their super uh, curled in limb tips, I find a great place is about two to two and a half inches in from the axle. And you don't have to actually make a huge, like you can break out a measuring tape or your T-square which has inches of measurement on it here. And if I actually measure this here, this one here is at uh, let's see here, it is about an inch and three quarters in from the limb tip. And that's where it really tunes for my wife with her setup and her really short draw length, about 25 inches. For guys like me with a really long draw length, you want a little bit more forgiveness. So like I said, that two and a half inch mark might end up being a really good spot for you. If you're shooting a solid limb bow with a, a limb driven rest, here we have a solid limb bow in the form of an elite impulse. You can still tie it in here on the split part of the limb or what I like to do is I'll actually tie the knot all the way up in here into the groove. Right here on any solid limbo like this where they cut the V-notch out to place the cam inside, that flare will start right around in here where it comes back into the center part of the limb. And I'll tie my knot there because that will always get pulled up against that flare. It can't slide any more forward. And since it's under tension, it can't slide back. So on a solid limbo, you can tie it in here on the little limb legs if you want. Just cut the sticky pad that comes with the rest from whatever manufacturer or just simply tie it up here on the V-notch. That will give you the most amount of, um, of clearance, if you will. It will pick up a little bit later and drop a little bit earlier. Or like I said, you can just always tie it in out here. I've played with it. I have an Elite Energy 35. I've put it on the old Primes, which were single limbs, and the old Matthew single camps, which were all solid limbos. I put it in that V-notch groove or you can stick it out the limb. Neither real rest style is better in terms of a drop away rest. Like there, each one has their own needs. Like I said, so limb driven sits completely flat the entire time. So you can have an arrow in here, hypothetically rattling around, right? Until you go to shoot and then it picks it up. And then when you let down, it falls out of the way and it could, you know, clank up against the riser. Adding a little bit of moleskin here, it completely uh, eliminates that issue or a little bit of stealth strips or hockey tape or something like that. Neither one of the rest styles is more inherently uh, problematic than the other. I personally like a limb driven because I mess with so many different arrows, different arrow styles, uh, different bows, target bows, short uh, axle axle hunting bows. Um, but probably in my store, it's probably a five to one uh, cable activated where the fork stays up all the time versus a limb driven rest. But to each their own, you pick what you want to shoot um, there's not, I will set up whatever you want and your local bow shop will probably as well. So that's all for this video on how I set up a drop away rest from beginning to end. If you have any questions about how I do this process that I didn't answer in this video, feel free to drop a comment down below here on YouTube. You can reach out to us on Facebook and Instagram at Average Jack Archery. And if you want to call Average Jack Archery Pro Shop Range your home shop here in Phillipsburg, PA, you can always come into our store. I'll post our hours below. Of course, you can always find them on Google and you can give us a call if you want to come in here and uh, place an order, become a customer. Uh, we do ship all across the continental for 
48 states. You can hit us up at 814-761-0675. Hope you're able to get outside, enjoy the sport of archery. Archery hunting, if you so choose, definitely enjoy God's beautiful creation. And we'll get to see you next time.